Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss direct finance lease. When it comes to leases, it gets very complicated for several reasons. One, time value of money is involved and we have residual value, guaranteed, non-guaranteed, and we also have many type of leases such as finance lease or sales type lease. It used to be called the capital lease, operating lease, and in this session we introduce a third category of leases, direct finance lease. It's very important before we start to discuss the direct finance lease, we want to do a quick review about what is a finance versus operating lease, because the direct finance lease carries on on this concept. So under GAAP, how do we classify whether a lease is a finance or operating lease? Well, we have to meet, for a lease to be classified as a finance lease, we have to meet any of the following criteria, which we're going to list, there's five of them, and the lease has to be non-cancellable. In other words, the person cannot easily get out of it without a substantial penalty. The first condition is the lease transfer ownership of the underlying asset to the lessee by the end of the lease. There's a transfer of ownership. Simply put, at the end of the lease, the person that leased this property, the leased this equipment, will keep it. There's a transfer of ownership. Two, the lease grant the lessee an option to purchase the underlying asset at a reasonably certain price to exercise. What does that mean? It means there's no transfer of ownership, but they're gonna give you a dollar amount that's substantially less than the fair market value of the asset, which is anyone any reasonable person will exercise. So if we met one, then that's it, it's a finance lease. If we did not meet one, if there's no transfer of ownership, if the lease agreement says, well, you can buy this property for $500 and this property is worth, for example, $10,000, no one's gonna pass this option. Therefore, there is a bargain purchase price. Well, if that, that exists, then the lease becomes a finance lease. If it does not, we look at the third option. The lease term is for the major part of the remaining economic life of the asset. Well, we're gonna have to quantify this. What does that mean? It means if you're gonna have this asset more than 75% of its life, you technically own it, you technically own the asset. So if you have a lease and it's three out of five, three out of five is 60%, that's not the majority of its life. If you have the lease for four years and the life of the asset is five, that's 80%, well, you, you, you could meet this requirement to classify the lease as a finance lease. If not, again, this is a review. If not, we would look at the Fourth option, we would look at the present value of the sum of the lease payment and any residual guaranteed value by the lessee that's not already reflected in the lease payment. It should equal or exceed substantially all the fair value of the underlying asset. What you do is you find the present value of the payment on the lease, the, the present value of the sum of the lease payment and any residual guaranteed value that's not already reflected in the payment. And if that number equal to 90% or more of the fair market value of the asset, you technically bought the asset. Therefore, you would have a finance lease. If not, if not, we'd look at the fifth condition. The underlying asset is such of a specialized nature that it's not expected to have any alternative use to the lessor at the end of the lease term. Simply put, the asset cannot be used for anyone else except you. If you're leasing it, you're technically buying it. If not, if you don't meet any of these conditions, I'm sorry, it's not a finance lease. It is an operating lease. And this is what we learned in the prior session, whether a lease is a finance lease or an operating lease. So how about this third category where we have what's called direct finance lease? And this is what we will discuss in the session. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. What's a direct finance lease? It employs by the lessor, the company that, that, that's getting the asset. Lessor employ a third lease category known as direct finance lease. When this happens in a unique scenario where the asset's control is transferred from the lessor or the lessee with the participation of a third party. So here, every lease has two parties, a lessor and a lessee. 
here what we're doing we are bringing a third party that's involved the third party is doing what it's getting it's guaranteeing the residual value and we'll see how it works so what's the basic difference then well the basic difference is the in a finance lease versus a sales type lease a sales type lease you sold the asset what does that mean it means the lessor will have a profit because it's a sales type you, you technically sold the asset and a direct finance lease what you are doing is you are financing the transaction well what does that mean it means in a sales type lease you reckon that you recognize the profit immediately well in a direct finance lease the profit is deferred and recognized over the life of the asset and the best way to illustrate this is to work an example but that's basically the difference between them if it's a direct finance lease it means there's the third party guaranteeing the residual value then we'll have a direct direct finance lease the lessor will slow down they will not book the profit immediately because it's not technically a sale best way to illustrate this is to look at an example assume robotics company the lessor enters into a lease agreement with amazon for the use of quick robotics package pickers we're going to call them the pickers the lease commences on january 1st year x zero with the with the term of three years the lease agreement is non-cancellable so at least we met you know the one of the conditions to be a finance lease requiring equal rental payment at the end of each period we are dealing with an ordinary annuity the picker has a value at the commencement of the lease of 30,000 means the asset has a value of 30,000 and a carrying value of 28 it means the cost to robotics is only tw it's 28 with an estimated residual value of 6,000 at the end of the lease that's fine the picker has an estimated economic life of five years Amazon provide a guarantee that the residual value of the picker will be at least 6,000 at the end of the lease. The lease contain no renewal option and the picker revert to robotics at the termination of the lease. Robotics sets the annual rental rate to earn a rate of 6% per year on its investment. So we need to figure out first whether this is an operating lease or a finance lease. Why? Because Amazon is guaranteeing the residual value. Remember, there's only two parties robotics and amazon let's fi figure out first whether this is a finance lease or an operating lease let's go through the conditions first condition is there a transfer of ownership and the answer is the picker um rental payment that there's i don't see any transfer of ownership there's no transfer of ownership in this lease therefore we did not meet test one is there a par purchase option test a bargain purchase option I don't see that they're gonna give them this robotics at for example ten dollars there's no bargain purchase price we did not meet this test lease term test well let's see the lease is for three years out of the five years that's 60 percent which is less than 75. now let's figure out the present value of the payments and we're going to see that on the next slide let's look at the present value of the payment let's look at the present value of the payment the present value of the payment is what the present value of the payment we're going to take first we have to find out what the payment is first it's two-step process how do you find the payment we're going to take a look at the fair value of the lease equipment which is thirty thousand minus the residual value because the residual value is different the residual value you have to come up with the residual value only once you have to come up with the residual value only once therefore we'll take six thousand we find the present value of this six thousand three period at six percent which is the present value of an of a single payment therefore the present value of six thousand six percent three period is five thousand thirty seven dollars and seventy two cent so what left to be recovered by the lessor through the through the payment is twenty four thousand nine hundred sixty two dollars and twenty eight cent then we're going to take this amount and divide this amount by the present value annuity factor 2.67301 you might be asking where these numbers are coming from the present value where is this 0.83962 and 2.67 at this point if you are if you if you are learning about direct finance lease you should be pretty comfortable with the time value of money if not you got to go back and learn about time value of money simply put you'll take this amount divided by how much you need to recover divided by the present value the payment becomes nine thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cents so the payment 
on this deal is 9338 now usually the payment is given to you you know the payment will be given to you here like the payment will be this much but if you have to compute the payment this is how you will compute the payment now what you do if we take the present value of the payment which is 9338 times the present value factor it come up to 24,962 we also have to find the present value of the guarantee residual value of 6,000 it comes up to 5,036 so the present value of the payment plus the present value of the residual value equal to 30,000 and the fair value of the equipment is 30,000 well well what does that mean it means we easily met option number four and what's option number four option number four is what the present value of the lease payment plus the guaranteed residual value is greater than 90 percent it's 100 percent therefore we met this test and this is a sales sales type lease so this is a sales type lease based on the present value test because it's non-cancelable and we met the present value so why did we do all of this if we're if we're learning about the direct finance lease what's the point of this well here's how we're going to turn this into a direct finance lease how do we turn this into a direct finance lease see here amazon provides a guarantee that the residual value will be six thousand switch amazon to a third party bank of china just making this up okay if bank of china just kind of get the point it's a third party provide a guarantee residual value then what we are dealing with it's not a sales type lease it's a direct financing lease direct financing lease but let's take a look at the journal entries for both at the initial so we can understand the difference so for a sales type lease if this was a sales type lease we would debit receivable 30,000 debit cost of goods sold 28 credit inventory 28 and credit sales revenue 30. simply put the robotics company sold sold this sold this robot to amazon therefore they would book a profit of 2000 remember this is if amazon is guaranteeing the residual value remember amazon is guaranteeing the residual value therefore it's a sales type lease well under the other scenario if we assume that a third party the bank of china is guaranteeing the residual value robotics will have a gross profit of 2000 but they will have to defer it so what entry will they make if it's guaranteed by an unrelated third party well here's what's going to happen we're still going to have a re lease receivable of 30000 we're going to have a deferred profit which is a contra account receivable of 2000 and we're going to remove the inventory for 28 so what's the difference between the two here the profit was booked here the profit is deferred and what type of account is deferred gross profit it's a contra asset therefore it's it start with a credit balance of 2000 now what are we going to do with this 2000 you guessed it what are we going to do with it we are going to amortize it how are we going to amortize it well not straight line method this is where we have to kind of learn a little bit more about this how to amortize this 2000 it will be cool if it's straight line right we divide by three and we spread it out but that's not the case let's go ahead and take a look at how we amortize and how we process journal entries for these payments what we are going to do first is to look at this transaction as a normal sale in other words a sales type lease so here's what's going to happen in a sales type lease robotic will have the following schedule they will have a lease receivable of thirty thousand. they would be earning six percent rate of return therefore what's going to happen is this at the end of the first year they would receive a payment of nine thousand three hundred and thirty eight how much interest of this payment well if we are using six percent which is this is how much they want to earn we'll take thirty thousand times six percent the interest component is one thousand eight hundred then if then if the payment is nine thousand three hundred and thirty eight eighteen hundred is interest the remainder is a reduction of the receivable therefore what's left in the receivable is twenty two thousand four sixty one then we will take this amount at the end of year one x one then we'll take this amount and we're going to multiply it by six percent to come up with the interest of one thousand three hundred forty seven dollar and sixty eight cent the payment is the same 
Some of it goes toward the interest, some of it goes toward the principal. The principal reduces the lease receivable to $14,470.40. Same concept repeat itself, you make a payment. The interest is $868.24 rounding. The, what's remaining is the loss reduction. Simply put, the last payment will have to have a lease receivable, the plug-in of 6,000. We cannot have, so, so we have to reduce it to bring it down to 6,000 because the last payment what we're paying for is the guaranteed residual value of 6,000. Therefore, after we complete the schedule, we figure out that the interest component, listen to me carefully, you're gonna thank me in a moment, the interest component on this deal for robotics is $4,015. That's all what we're saying here. Then we're gonna have to prepare another schedule for the direct lease direct lease. Now, what do we do under the direct lease? Under the direct lease, here we're going to be assuming, not assuming, we're going to be earning 9.5%. So what's, why is there a difference between 9.5 and 6%? Because we have to prepare another schedule and you're going to see why. The reason is this. Here, what we are doing is we are starting with a net receivable of 28,000. Why? Because someone else is guaranteeing the residual value. What does that mean? It means it's not 30,000, we are starting with 28,000. Therefore, we need to find out what interest rate, what interest rate do we need to discount the payments and the present value to come up with zero. Now, you don't have to do this. You can do this. It can be done through trial and error. Simply put, what you're doing, you're starting here with 30, you're starting here with 28. You have to discount the payments. You have to discount the $6,000, the single, residual value payment to come up with zero. Well, the rate is 9.5, it's given to you. You don't have to worry about it on the CPA exam. I highly doubt it that you have to deal with a direct finance lease. I'm just telling you how we came up with this payment. Therefore, the interest rate on this lease, when we compute our interest, it's gonna be 9.5, and you're gonna see why in a moment. Then we'll prepare the schedule. The net receivable is 28,000. Then we receive the first payment. Well, we're going to multiply the balance of receivable times 9.5. So we're going to take 28,000, multiply it by 9.5, and it's going to give us 2,660 in interest receivable. Then, if this is the interest component, the remainder is what? The remainder must be the receivable, which is re reducing the balance, $6,678.64. The balance will go down to $21,321.36. Now we're gonna repeat the process again. What does that mean? It means we have to compute our interest based on 9.5% and the balance, which will give us interest receivable $2,025. Therefore, the annual lease payment will be spread between the interest component based on 0.95 and the reduction of the receivable. The balance goes down to 14. Again, we repeat the process and remember the lease receivable has to be at 6,000 because the annual lease payment, the last one is 6,000. So notice what's gonna happen here. The difference between the interest receivable or the interest received under 6% and 9% is exactly, is exactly $2,000. And what's that $2,000? That's the deferred profit. So how are we how are we going to journalize the entry when robotics received the first payment? When robotics received the first payment, great, $9,338.64. We debit cash. How much do we credit lease revenue? We're going to credit lease revenue based on 9.5%, which is $2,000. $2,660. Now, this $2,000, $2,660, part of it interests, part of it is profit. Remember, when you lease, you're going to have profit on the sale itself, and you're leasing this, you're going to have interest. So the interest revenue is $2,660. How much of it profit, how much of it is interest? Well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to be using those two schedules you need two schedules again that's why most likely you will not see you will not see this on the CPA exam the interest is this 1800 and the total revenue is 2660 so if we take 2660 minus 1800 we'll come up with 860 
this is the deferred revenue you are going to be recognizing this period remember we had 2000 of deferred revenue if you remember we said deferred revenue started at 2000 and guess what now we are earning some of it how much are we earning 860 right, well we're going to debit the third revenue 860 and the remainder is the least receivable which is how much 7000 we reduce the least receivable seven thousand five hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent so why did we prepare the two schedule to figure out how much of the revenue is interest how much of the revenue is profit because we figure out the interest now we want to kind of blend blend both interest and profit to figure it out we have to find out the inter the interest receivable based on 9.5 then take out the pure interest which is the 1800 what else can we do is we can prepare an amortization schedule for the deferred for the deferred not revenue deferred profit remember the deferred profit is 2000 and what we do based on the two schedules remember what we did in interest receivable at six percent which is 1800 lease revenue based on 9.5 from the previous slides the difference between them is the profit the deferred profit then this deferred profit will be we started at 2000 year one we reduced it by 860 where remainder the remainder is 1140 year two we'll do the same thing we look at both schedules and we take the difference between a and b this is two different schedule 1347 and 2025 which are we're looking here at 1347 and 2025 2025 the difference is 677.85 again the deferred profit is reduced to 462.15 then the difference between the last one is 462.15 this way we used up all the deferred gross profit and again this is the journal entry we saw it earlier now also you want to know how things are presented on the balance sheet you might be asked to do so on the exam the least receivable will be 30,000 minus seven thousand five hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent and by the end of the first year because you reduced it by this much so therefore the thirty thousand least receivable the initial entry of thirty thousand minus what you reduced it by the end of the year least receivable is twenty two thousand four sixty one then the deferred gross profit started at two thousand then we reduced it by eight sixty the remainder is one thousand one hundred and forty therefore least receivable minus the deferred profit will give us the net lease receivable which is the account receivable minus the deferred profit remember the deferred profit is a contra asset account let's take a look at the year two payment which is once you know year one you should be able to know year two we received cash of nine thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent that's fine the gross profit is the difference between two thousand twenty five and one thousand three hundred forty seven dollars which is from the other schedule this is how much deferred profit we are going to have the lease revenue is 2025 again the lease revenue here is spread between interest and profit because we defer in the profit and we're recognized it re recognizing it now and least receivable will be reduced by 7990 based on the first schedule which is the six percent schedule again if you know how to do year one and year two you can do year three year four so on and so forth it does not make a difference the cash the lease revenue is spread between the deferred gross profit from the deferred gross profit schedule and the eight thousand four hundred seventy dollars a reduction in receivable okay assuming that the asset has a fair value of six thousand at the end of the year so it's going to be year, year x two x sorry it should be x3 x3 we debit inventory six thousand we credit least receivable of six thousand because the inventory is going back to us someone is guaranteeing the inventory and we credit the least receivable of six thousand dollar so hopefully in this lesson i showed you the difference between a direct finance lease then a sales type lease the main difference is and this is basically most likely you will be responsible for is when is profit recognized under a sales type lease profit is recognized immediately the 2000 is booked immediately under a direct finance lease you have to recognize the profit that 2000 over the life of the lease therefore you have to have two schedule 
one for the how much they want to earn and one based on the effective rate to bring the balance down to zero you compare those two schedules I hope this is helpful but once again most likely you don't have to worry about preparing a schedule on the CPA exam but you might want to know how the mechanics work what should you do now you want to practice more multiple choice um, look at more resources that's going to help you do better whether you are taking an accounting course or studying for the CPA exam your CPA exam is 20 30 40 year investment in your career don't shortchange yourself invest in yourself it's worth it good luck study hard and of course stay safe